Okay, so today we are looking at topic six, which is water quality and water management. Okay, so in order to make sure that our water is clean and safe enough to drink, it gets tested regularly. Um, we have to make sure the water is not contaminated with any organisms or harmful substances that can cause diseases. Okay, so if the water is not safe to drink, um, it must be processed then to remove any unwanted substances. So when we talk about water quality, this is the characteristics of a water resource that make it suitable or unsuitable for various uses. So um, is it okay for drinking or is it okay for recreational activities, um, laundry, or maybe for agriculture or or for animals. Um, so keep that in mind, uh, the definition of water quality, the characteristics of a water resource that make it suitable or unsuitable for various uses. So what determines water quality? So even though you're drinking water looks, smells, and tastes clean, doesn't always mean there's nothing else in it. Um, so dissolved solids, these are salts such as sodium, calcium, magnesium that are found dissolved in water. If you have hard water, that means you've got water that contains a lot of dissolved calcium and magnesium. Um, and that's what causes those scaly deposits in pipes or fixtures and washing machines. Um, and then soft water will have less uh, of those, less of the calcium and magnesium in it. So this, for example, this is an, an electric kettle element. And you can see the deposits of salts that are left by um, after water has evaporated. So that would be hard water. Um, so dissolved solids, you know, that's just one factor that can affect water quality. Um, organisms, chemicals, sediments can also affect water quality. Um, and these substances can get into the water from the runoff, from the land, from plants and animals, from soil and rocks, and from human activities. So the presence of different substances in the water determines how people will use that water. Um, so for example, water that is good for one use, it may not be good enough for another, like it may not be good enough for drinking. For example, water that has a bad flavor, it may be suitable enough for irrigating crops, but not for drinking. Uh, water and people, so human activities add substances to the water, and many of these substances are pollutants that can harm living things. Um, we talked about algal blooms last class. That's when too many nutrients can cause problems like, like fertilizers um, getting into um, the water systems. Um, so that would be one example. Um, so any toxic substance that we are talking about would be any poisonous substance. Um, so toxic substances are used in lots of things. They're used in like agriculture, manufacturing, production, mining, refining, and many of these substances can kill organisms even if they're present in very small amounts and they end up in the water. Um, for example, PCBs, which, were which are used to make electrical um, transformers, um, those can get into the water system. So this diagram is just showing different sources of pollution. Uh, here from boats, we've got garbage, um, oil spills, um, industrial waste, air pollution, agricultural runoff, um, treated sewage, urban runoff. So a lot of different ways that um, toxic substances can enter our, um, enter our water. Um, here we're looking at acid precipitation. So pollutants can enter the water systems when toxic substances are also released into the air. They can still enter our water systems. Um, acid precipitation is caused by dissolved sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. Um, these are waste gases. They're usually released by coal burning industries, uh, metal smelters, and automobiles. So once, once those gases are in the atmosphere, they will then combine with the water va vapor in the atmosphere and they'll form sulfuric acids and nitric acids. 
These chemicals will then return to Earth in precipitation as rain or snow. Um, that can be more acidic than vinegar at times. Um, and that acidic precipitation is going to sink into the ground. Um, it can start to dissolve heavy metals in the soil and rock, such as aluminum, mercury, and lead. And then these dissolved metals might eventually work their way through the ground into our streams and rivers, which can cause even more damage um, to organisms. All right, so that's what we can see in this figure here. Burning fuels um, produces sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. The winds will blow gases over long distances. The gases will then combine with the water vapor. They'll produce um, sulfuric acid and nitric acids, and then um, precipitation and all of that acid precipitation will enter um, the ground and eventually into um, our water. Uh, so ecosystems and lakes um, can get damaged. Uh, just to clarify the pH scale, um, to describe how acidic a solution is. If we're at about pH of seven, that is neutral. As we move to the left, um, we're getting more acidic. So we can see here normal rain. Normal rain is about 5.6 pH. Um, the most acidic rain recorded was at about 2.0. Here's vinegar, uh, 2.8. Um, so as we move left, we're getting more and more acidic. And then um, towards the right, we're getting more alkaline or basic. All right, so next is measuring water quality. Um, the effects of toxic substances on human health can take many years to show up. That's why it's important to identify toxic substances in the water, even if they occur in very small amounts. So here are some selected analysis to determine water quality. Um, so like basic properties like temperature, oxygen content, color, odor, solids, we're looking at its sediments, cloudiness, also called turbidity, acidity, its pH, nutrients within it, phosphorus, nitrogen, other dissolved solids like salts, also looking at toxic substances like heavy metals, which include lead, mercury, zinc, other chemicals that are toxic like PCBs or pesticides, and then also looking at organisms. Um, bacteria or plants and animals. So organisms in the water, um, some species can only survive in unpolluted water that has lots of oxygen. Other organisms are able to live in water that is slightly polluted. So scientists can determine the quality of the water just by studying um, the numbers and kinds of different organisms that live in those water systems. Um, bacteria, for example, um, they occur naturally in water systems um, and they pass through the body without harm. But um, when the number of certain bacteria gets too high, they can cause health problems. Um, for example, the fecal coliform bacteria population can increase if raw sewage from cities or farms gets into the groundwater, streams and lakes. Then if there's outbreaks of that bacteria, it can cause or pose a serious um, health risk to people. I'll uh, just pause. Uh, we'll talk about bioindicator species. So um, a bioindicator species, these are sensitive or important species whose numbers can show the health of an ecosystem. Um, different kinds of plants, birds, fish, turtles, and amphibians, especially frogs and salamanders, um, can help monitor the health of ecosystems. Um, so invertebrates, these are animals without backbones, such as crayfish, clams, and insects, they're also useful. Um, for this purpose of determining, um, for example, water quality. Um, so, for example, changes in the numbers, numbers of stonefly, caddisfly, and mayfly larvae that live in streams can tell about the amount of pollution present in the water. Um, pollutants in water systems, so like acid precipitation, waste water, and pesticides can affect the reproduction of leopard frogs, shown here. Um, so as a result, their numbers may drop long before people realize that there's a problem with the qu water quality. And that's because um, amphibians, frogs, um, they are very sensitive um, to their surroundings. Some more 
uh, bioindicator species. These are some invertebrate bioindicator species for flowing streams and rivers. So like I said, um, scientists can see what organisms are, are, are living in that water source to see or to kind of lead them in the right direction of, of the water quality. So for example, these organisms here, uh, stonefly larva, mayfly larva, dragonfly larva, caddisfly larva, and the beetle, they can only live in clean water. Um, these ones can live in slightly polluted water, snail, the leech, the crayfish, okay, but you wouldn't find these ones living here because they can only live in clean water. And then these ones are some more here that can live only in clean water as well, midgefly, larva, and segmented worms. Okay, so we'll pause here. All right, so next we are looking at monitoring water quality. So governments of Canada as well as Alberta have set standards for water quality. So there are guidelines put in place for maximum amounts of substances that are allowed to be in the water, including pollutants. So the water quality standards are set for drinking water for people, um, protection of organisms living in or near water, the drinking water for livestock, um, irrigation of crops, and then recreation, um, for example, swimming. Um, water management, this is the process of maintaining a safe water supply. Um, so there's variations in the weather from year to year, and that can make it difficult to balance the supply of water with the demand. For example, some areas may get too little rainfall, other areas might get too much. Um, there might be rain um, in one season, but not another. So one way to make water supplies more reliable is to build a dam across a river. Um, a dam holds back the water flow, um, but it also causes the water to flood land upstream, um, forming a lake or reservoir. So there are problems with dams as well as the advantages of dams. Um, some problems are those flooded valleys. They, they may be a part of the traditional home of Aboriginal people. Um, that water can um, kill the trees there. It can force many animals to leave and maybe have to go to higher ground. Um, if there's toxic substances in the soil, that can make their way through the food chain into local fish. Um, and then people that are not close to rivers are going to have to um, dig wells. Um, so here in this diagram, we're just looking at water management and how it involves the wise use of water, um, balancing the needs of consumers, industries, agriculture, and wildlife. So here we can just see um, residential indoor water use in Canada um, and, and just how it's being used. Um, as well as here, this is from the 1990s. I'm not sure what year this is from. Um, so purifying water. Um, so the water cycle, it moves water back and forth, as we've seen when we were studying the water cycle. Um, so water is being moved back and forth between the atmosphere, the land, and the oceans. Um, but that process is also purifying water as it recycles it. So most of the water vapor in the atmosphere is coming from the oceans, but rainwater is fresh water, it's not salt water, because the salt is not being evaporated, it's just, just the water. Um, so evaporation, then followed by condensation, it distills the seawater, separating pure water from salts and other dissolved substances. So although that water cycle it can purify water, pollutants can enter the cycle at any point. Um, so the water that we use for drinking, it has to be cleaned. Um, potable water, it means it is safe to drink. So that's what that term potable means. Um, so many communities will clean their water through a water treatment plant. So in Calgary, we have water treatment plants. Um, so what happens um, in a water treatment plant is firstly, um, water in the river or lake, it'll move through an intake pipe. There's a screen here that keeps out any debris and fish. Um, and number two, there's a pump here that's moving the water to the treatment plant. Um, three here, chemicals are added. They stick to suspended materials as well as most bacteria. 
Next, we'll have suspended solids. We'll settle down to the bottom of this huge settling tank. Uh, here, the water gets pumped through filter beds of sand and gravel. So here, smaller particles are going to get trapped, leaving that water clear um, as well as drinkable. But at number six, um, chlorine or ozone may be added to kill any remaining germs and bacteria. Um, fluoride may also be added in many communities for tooth protection. And then lastly, that clean, safe drinking water is now uh, delivered through underground pipes to homes and businesses. All right, and then what happens to water after you use it in your home? So sewage, this is the solid and liquid waste from homes, businesses, and industries. Um, so in urban areas, there are underground pipes that will carry the sewage to a sewage treatment plant. If you're in a rural area, that sewage gets stored in a large underground container that's called a septic tank. And then um, every so often that tank has to be cleaned out. Um, so the contents of the tank get cleaned out regularly and it gets taken to the sewage treatment plant. So that sewage gets treated. Um, it's going to remove, remove the impurities. Once it gets treated, treated, it's called wastewater, which is also called effluent. Now that effluent can go back into rivers, lakes, groundwater, and the sea. That effluent is also um, used to irrigate crops. Okay, and then sustaining uh, water resources. As the human population keeps growing, the demand for water continues to increase. Um, increasing consumption of water, it has reduced the quantity of water in reservoirs and underground aquifers throughout the world. Um, so shortages of water, they have forced some countries to start developing these costly desalination plants. This is one in Mexico, which is making fresh water from seawater. So basically, um, these plants, they're producing fresh water by removing the salts from seawater through evaporation. It is very costly, very expensive. Um, there's two other math methods of generating fresh water from seawater. It's a distillation and reverse osmosis. Um, so in distillation, um, for example, if we have seawater in here, um, that's getting being heated and changing it to a gas. And then it's going to go through the condenser um, to change it back to a liquid again to get the pure water. So it's basically removing the dissolved solids, such as the salts, by leaving them behind. And the pure water gets evaporated. So steam, it goes through the condenser. The steam will condense as it cools through here, and we get pure water. All right, the salt, which is the solute, um, it collects on the bottom of the flask as the water evaporates. So that's the process of distillation. Um, reverse osmosis, this is another method. Um, so high pressure will push water through a membrane. Here's a membrane um, towards the pure water. Any dissolved particles or salts are going to get left behind. Um, the large particles are first removed from the water by filters. And then after other contaminants have been removed, the pumps produce the pressure that's needed to push the water through the membranes to remove the salt. All right, so this is um, normal osmosis, and then this is reverse osmosis um, using the pumps. Um, other ways or things you can do, like on a personal level, to keep water clean, um, use environmentally friendly household products to do cleaning, um, take any toxic substances to a disposal facility, um, like designating depots. So any toxic substances, that includes like paints, solvents, motor oils, don't dump them into um, like into your sinks. Um, consider using canoes or rowboats or sailboats rather than motorboats. Um, composting um, instead of using artificially produced fertilizers to do your garden. Those are some methods. And just keep in mind that 
much of the damage to water systems. It can be reversed. Um, in many parts of the world, people are taking action to restore rivers and lakes to better health. First step is to stop pollution. Um, so industrial as well as domestic wastes used to be just dumped into rivers and lakes. Now they have to be disposed of in other ways or they have to be treated to remove any harmful substances before they get dumped into back into uh, rivers and lakes. Um, runoff into waterways can be reduced by planting um, protective buffer zones of trees, shrubs and grasses um, because they'll take up um, the water instead of it just being runoff. Um, plants will also prevent erosion. They'll also help restore fish habitats. Um, making water supplies sustainable. So stop wasting water. Um, it's far less expensive to avoid wasting water than trying to develop methods to obtain more. All right, so I'm just going to pause here.